this week on Kentucky Field. Early wood duck season might have started this weekend, but the prep work needed to make it possible began months ago with a bang. For our sportsmen to have this opportunity, we know we got to put the work in. Next, you do know it's deer season, right? We'll get you ready to hit the woods with some tree stand do's and don'ts. I am tied in, tethered in. I'm ready for my hunt. And need to know information on quota hunts. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> first Saint Leo. Yeah, we're here to get the keeper. Here it goes. Boom! Oh, oh. Nice. Oh. Wow, that happened. Hello and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. I am super excited to be here in Nelson County. Tonight is my very first deer hunt of the 2018 deer season. But first, let's go to the Slough's Wildlife Management Area and tag some ducks. He's putting out the uh, rocket charges, so I'm gonna go ahead and put the bait out. And we put the bait basically two foot from the net. It seems close, but that's how close you actually have to have them up next to the net to catch them. For whatever reason, I was thinking they were going up, but they're not going up at all. They're really just shooting along the ground. Well, the, the, the power of the rocket, like when we shoot, it's amazing. These, these T-posts will be almost at a 45 degree angle. Really? Because it's got that much force that it'll actually push the rocket. So when, they, when that propulsion hits, it's going to shoot the rocket up high. It's much higher than what you would imagine. So right now what we're doing is we're just opening up these rockets here. And once he gets the bait put out and we're ready to shoot the rockets, we'll put the rockets in, hook them up to the, the detonator cord, and we'll be ready to shoot the rockets off. But this is the most important part right here, is actually attaching the net <laughs> to the rocket. So here, we're here at Slough's. This is my first time at the Slough's WMA. How many acres is this WMA? The entire WMA is roughly 11,000 acres. Oh, wow. Where we're at here is called the Saw Heaver Unit. Okay. And the Saw Heaver Unit is where our waterfowl refuge is at, and it's kind of where we do the most of our active management for waterfowl. All right, Greg, if you want to do a quick rundown behind me and just double check me. Clevises were all tight. Okay. Now what we'll do is we'll walk back to the blind and uh, we'll chest our connection with the galvanometer. Okay. And then after that, we'll be we'll be set. So everything is set and ready to go. We've got our helping your biologist back there, just waiting for the blast. Now it's just a waiting game. And it's not a waiting game to see a few birds show up. It's really, you're trying to maximize your numbers here, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to time it of when we shoot the net that we have the most number of birds up on the bay. They need to be pretty much a couple feet from the net to be confident that you can catch them. So they need to be right there up where we put the bait at. I'd say kind of up their feet right now, there's probably about 50 or 60. And I know it doesn't look like it, but they're not close enough yet to the net. What they'll usually do is they'll do that. And why they do that, it's actually not a bad thing. You know, as long as they stay close, which they, they did. So what, what's back then? I don't know. They'll do this three or four times. I think they just start getting kind of, they don't like being up on that sand away from the water. So you gotta be kind of quick on the draw pull the trigger so that when they're coming up that you do it before they flush because they'll give you maybe a minute or two before they'll do that. Hopefully those birds come back because that 
makes me nervous if they get up and actually fly away. And they're coming right back. Guys, I might actually attach the detonator. I see some birds that from that left are starting to move up. So what do I got to do to help? Just kind of pull these nets out. Just make sure no birds are going to get out or any ones that are tangled real bad. From what we had, that's that's a pretty good shot. Oh, yeah. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Yeah, that's a good shot. Oh, man. Some of them were, I mean, literally right up against they the were. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Yeah. How's it going? Good, yourself? Oh, pretty good. Start trapping this morning. Yeah, <laughs> well, something different for me. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. We got all the rockets. All right, guys, start start picking. So now the process, we've shot the uh, rockets and we've got a hundred and something ducks in here, most likely. And now the biologists will be pulling the ducks and bringing them over. And this is the banding station. And you can see here they've got four or five different categories. Immature males, adult males, immature females, and adult females. And they're gonna look at them right here and decide what they are, and then band it accordingly. And then, once that happens, they'll turn these birds loose pretty quickly. First bird wasn't until 5:30. They've been late all summer though. Crazy, these new generation ducks. These are millennial wood <laughs> ducks. Millennial ducks, yeah, they think they been late. <laughs> they had to stop and get their Starbucks coffee. <laughs> this is an immature male, and see how straight it is. Now on the females, they're more of a teardrop. V notched. See how it's got a V-notch right mm -hmm. here? That tells right off the bat that it's immature. You got a male and a female, both of them immature. Both of them. So Kentucky, Tennessee, and Florida, um, a lot of people don't realize, are the only three states in the country that have a early wood duck season. Okay. So us catching these wood ducks is extremely important, especially here in Kentucky because without that banding data, we can't justify having the season. We really need to have these birds banded because we have such a high take during that September season. Mm -hmm. By getting these bands put on these birds, you know, we can really monitor the population. You know, we get a lot of people that come here to wood duck hunt in the early season. So we, we know how important that is to our sportsmen and we know how important it is for us I mean, to continue to be able to have that opportunity for our sportsmen to get this data out. Because like I had said, without this data, we can't justify having that September season. So, you know, for our sportsmen to have this opportunity, we know we gotta put the work in. Well, I'm settled in for this evening's hunt. And as you can tell, I'm wearing my safety harness. I would never deer hunt without a safety harness. And it's just as important to wear that harness when you're hanging your stand as well. Now I'm gonna demonstrate how you would attach a lock-on stand. I've chosen a tree right here. This tree would obviously be very hard to climb with a climbing style stand because of the number of branches on it. I've already attached the first two steps because these I can do from the ground. The next process is to climb up, attach the next step, pull my stand up and attach that. And I'm gonna do it always being attached to the tree. First thing you're gonna need is a good pull rope. And so what I'm gonna do is attach this string to me, go down around five feet, and I'm gonna attach the next step. 
Once I've got that done, I'm gonna go down to the end of my rope and actually attach the tree stand that I'm going to be hanging. Now, from here, I'm ready to attach myself to the tree, go up the, the ladder, and pull my next set of steps up. All right, to stay attached to the tree, I am using what's called a lineman's belt here. So to use this, you can see that my safety harness has these loops right here, and that they're on both sides. And that is what this is for. You run it through one of the loops, run the rest of your rope through, and that creates your attachment point on one side. You wanna go around the tree and attach the other using the carabiner with the locking mechanism to the other side. Now I can adjust how tight I am to the tree by pulling on this knot, which is called a Prusik knot. I can get tight or I can back off the tree a little more depending on the size and how far or how close I want to be to it. So at this point in time, I just climb up the ladder, working this around and I can lean back up to this point right here. I want to then find the rope that I've got uh, my next step attached to, which is right here and pull it on up. Once I've got up here, I want to detach my rope and let that fall to the ground. It's still attached to me. Slide this on. Once you get this on, I want to go and attach this step and pull it tight. Now, my next step is secure. I'm ready to move on up the tree. So as you move up the tree, if you have limbs like this, you will get to points where you, you can't go up any further because your lineman's belt is under the limb. What you want to do at that point in time is to make sure you use three points of contact. I've got two feet two hands. I'm going to untie this, untether myself, and then pull myself up and over and around the limbs using three points of contact. I still have my feet and my hands, and then reattach myself and proceed on up the tree. The next step, what I want to do is to pull the stand up and get it attached. You can see why a lineman's belt is so important. I have two hands to manipulate this stand and put it where I want it. Otherwise, that would not be possible. So now I've got my stand up where I want it. It's in position. I need to take these straps wrap them around and hook them up. Now I'm gonna go ahead and attach my top strap and start to pull it snug. So the last thing you wanna to do to snug this thing down real good is to lift your platform up and pull your belts tight. Once you get that done, when your base hits the tree, it's gonna really pull these tight. So I am locked in right there and really, really tight. So the next thing I need to do is to attach my tether above the stand so that I can hook into it. I'm gonna step up one more step, still attached to the tree with my lineman's belt. And go ahead and attach my tether. I can adjust this to the right height when I get in. But right now I got that attached in there very tight. I wanna go ahead and grab my carabiner that's on my safety harness and lock in. Remembering to screw that thing back down on there so that it can't open up. Now it's time for me to take the lineman's belt off and step into the stand. So I'm gonna go ahead and unscrew this over here and detach myself from the lineman's belt. Remember, I attached the tether up here first so that I'm always connected to the tree. So now my lineman's belt is free and clear, and I can go ahead and step in.
Now that I'm in the stand, I need to get my tether up about head height. Well, unfortunately, I got all these limbs in the way. So I got two options. I can saw all these limbs off and slide it up or reattach my lineman's belt so that I can detach to the tether and raise it up to where it needs to be. I'm gonna go for option two because these are a lot of limbs to saw. So now I am reattached to the tree using my lineman's belt. I'm gonna detach from my tether and put it into the appropriate position. I've got my strap back up here attached tightly to the tree. Now I'm gonna reconnect again and after this, I shouldn't need my lineman's belt again until it's time to get down. So I am tied in, tethered in. My stand is ready, it's attached. I'm ready for my hunt. Now, I wanna show you why you wanna keep this tether really high. As you can see, I'm kinda of down at this area right here. On this particular stand, if I was to reach down and try to grab my bow and I was to slide out, you can see I am literally suspended and hanging right, right now. It looks like my butt's on the seat, but I'm actually su completely suspended. Because I got that thing in the right position, it gives me the opportunity to try to get my feet back under me, use my hands on the tether, and stand back up. If I had this thing down here and I fell out, I would be below the stand and I would be in a situation with a lot of clothes on it, especially if it's cold weather, try to grab the stand and to pull myself up and over it can be a really dangerous situation. So you want to avoid that. So deer season's right around the corner. We've showed you the safe way to use these types of climbing and lock-on stands. I know a lot of times you're in a hurry, you're wanting to get in the woods, but make sure you follow these safety procedures and you'll have a safe season and return home to your family after each hunt. If you've fished a spin real much, you have probably experienced line twist. Here's a really simple way to fix that on the water. So my line is really getting twisted up and what happens when I'm reeling it up real slow when I drop it back down, I'm losing my feel because my line is spinning and it'll make a big spin on there. The way to fix that, you take your bait off and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull out about 10 or 15 feet of line and then open my bail. And we're gonna use the trolling motor or the big engine and go as slow as we can. And what we'll do, what we'll do is it'll let that line unspool and what you'll get when you, after you do that and you pull it through the water for a while when you get your line back in you won't be getting so many twists well that's pretty yes it is once you get a, a little line off you can just let it loose and it, it'll go out by itself i do about half my spool there let about half of it off you can see that the water is just going to pull that line right off there there's no bait there's nothing on the end of here and you can see how that's just pulling it off. And you've got to have, you've got to take the bait off or all you'll do is twist it more. So now I'm just pulling line that's nothing's on the end of it through the water. And I'm sure that end of that line is, is just sitting there twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting and it'll pull itself straight. Once that happens, I won't have that problem. Now I'm gonna reel it in, retie my bait on there and that should be a huge improvement. Before, when I had some slack in it, it would have a huge amount of twist. Now look at it. It's absolutely, completely limp. So we'll see, that, that should make a huge, huge difference. September is the month to sign up for quota hunts throughout the state of Kentucky at fw.ky.gov. Now let's take a look back at a quota hunt we visited at Cleaver WMA. So here with Scott Farrell, we're at Kleber WMA, and this is the quota hunt yes. for 2016. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how many hunters we've got today. We've got 122 checked in right now. Mm -hmm. We drew 176. Mm -hmm. We had like around 311 apply for this hunt. Okay. So the quota hunts have been going on in Kentucky for a long time, and this is a great opportunity for someone who doesn't have a piece of property, or if you just want to go out and experience a new piece of property to put in for these WMA hunts. But that's not the reason we do it. We do it, it obviously the opportunity is good, but it's for data sampling and our deer population control measures, right? Right, we're an archery only management area. Mm -hmm. So 
We have two firearm quota hunts each year. Mm -hmm. The first weekend of November, the first weekend of December. That provides hunters that don't have private property that they can hunt. They can come to a WMA if drawn and have an opportunity to gun hunt for deer. And that helps us also reduce doe numbers, help manage the herd a little better on the WMAs. What do you think about our quota hunts here in the state of Kentucky? Uh, hey, it's a good opportunity. The female deer will do a, uh, of course, age and weigh. We're going to this year start to take a new measurement from eyeball to nostril measurement. Five and five eighths is the measurement on that, which helps another way to distinguish doe fawns from adult does. Well, you got you a great doe. This will be great for the table. That's right. And uh, congratulations on your, your doe harvest. Right. Thank you a bunch. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. So we're a week away from gun season, but yet people can gun hunt on our WMAs during the quota hunt. Yes. Nice deer. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Have you uh, done this quota hunt in years past? First time. Okay. First, First time. time. Yeah. So that's a really unique opportunity too, because it's not taking away from their gun hunting season somewhere else. Exactly. But we changed a couple years. It is their buck tag if they harvest a buck. Yes, it counts against the statewide tag. When we had the bonus buck tags, a lot of bucks that probably wouldn't normally be harvested were getting harvested. Mm -hmm. And since we've done away with the, uh, the bonus buck tag, we're seeing people being a little more choosy. We're seeing better bucks being harvested. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, people want to save that buck tag, that one buck tag that they have for a, for a nice buck if they can get it. Part of the data that you're pulling here is to age these deer, right? Yes, we'll take weights of the deer, field dress weight. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll age each deer uh, on the male deer. We'll do antler beam mm -hmm. diameter measurements. 1.29. We'll measure outside spread. 16 and three quarters. We're gonna be pulling some ticks for tick sampling. And that's gonna tell us, you know, what kind of species of ticks we're getting in the area and what kind of diseases they're carrying and uh, how it affects the deer. There's a lot of WMAs across the state of Kentucky. I think that we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 WMAs with quota hunts on them. Mm -hmm. Almost 4,500 hunters are gonna be hunting WMA properties. This gives us a really good opportunity to get a good biological sample throughout the state. Yes. Hey, we got a deer coming in. We've been sitting here, let's, uh, right. let's check it out and see what we've got. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here is a trophy striper caught by Pryor Phillips on the Cumberland River. This fish weighed 38 pounds. Nice job. Now this here is a very, very impressive crappie. 3.2 pounds, 18 inches long, caught by Paul Kreider on Cave Run Lake. Nice fish. Here's a happy young man, Jake who is five years old and caught this nice fish while fishing at a farm pond in Henry County. Congratulations. Here's eight-year-old Kylan Ellenberg who caught this 28-pound blue catfish in the Green River. This here's our biggest fish so far and she had to ask her brother Wyatt to help her hold it. Nice job. Here we have Robert Lamance who caught this nice bass at Taylorsville Lake. Said he actually caught it while he was crappie fishing. Nice job. Here's a nice bow kill from Fort Knox. This is Bobby Best and he's from Stevensburg, Kentucky. This is an impressive deer. Nice job. Here we have Cameron Vick with his very first fish ever. He caught this in the Parklands at a Fins Lake in Jefferson County. Here we have a nice velvet buck taken by James Gibson. He took this on the opening day of the bow season in Glendale, Kentucky. Nice job. Check out this impressive bull elk taken by Matt Stafford in Knott County, Kentucky. Congratulations. Well, tonight's bow hunt did not pan out exactly as I was hoping. I did have two does come down right at dark, but they just didn't get close enough. The best thing about bow hunting here in the state of Kentucky is I have four more months to try to close the deal. So remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. If you hold a Kentucky hunting or fishing license, then you have helped make possible Kentucky's wildlife management areas, places to hunt, fish, bird watch, or just let your mind wander. With nearly 100 dotting the Commonwealth, put wildlife management areas in your sights for fall hunting and see more of what makes Kentucky's outdoors outstanding. Get all the information online at fw.ky.gov. 
Dear Mom, I know a secret. You're a kid too. Salado is open and open for fun. <laughs> we can go see deer, wink at wildcats, and giggle at that big black bear. You know he's your favorite. There's enormous elk, awesome aquariums, and we can even take a picnic lunch. And if you're really good, I'll let you take me back again. The Salado Wildlife Education Center in Frankfurt. Come prowl a while.